sort of take us through. And at a later point of time, Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee will be moderating it and taking the questions also. Uh, the floor is on to you, Malay and Sydney, whoever wishes to start it. I think yeah. Melissa can start the, uh, this one yeah. first presentation so, and yeah. after that we'll take the uh, this one questions. Yeah. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, this stem cells is a, a, a basic uh, science topic. Uh, but not only related to psychiatry and neuropsychiatric disorders or developmental disorders. Uh, the scope of uh, understanding and learning things about stem cells is cross-cutting across the entire medicine. Um, so what we have tried to do today is, you know, um, see, uh, first let me tell you one thing. Uh, first, I'll welcome Sydney. Uh, Sydney, welcome. Uh, Thank you. So, so, so the difference between me and Sydney is that... Uh, uh, in spite of us both being psychiatrists, uh, when it comes to basic sciences, I have got an armchair kind of an approach. So I read, I try to make sense, I present, I discuss. Uh, Sidney has had a lot of experience of working in genetics when he was at Nimans. So he has got an edge uh, when it comes to the uh, technical and you know in-depth understanding of topics like this. So what we have decided we'll do is, that uh, we'll begin today's session with a small kind of uh, presentation, which I'll be doing, which will cover some aspects uh, of uh, stem cells as I think uh, psychiatrists we should understand. Uh, after that, uh, we will uh, you know kind of discuss uh, more about stem cells with uh, whatever we have learned uh, in this 15-20 uh, minute kind of presentation. And we'll also be taking questions from the audience. So please feel free to keep the chat box running. And with that, uh, uh, I'll share my presentation. And let's start going. Yeah. OK. Right. So stem cells in, stem cells in psychiatry. Now, there is a, a, you know, a not very new, but relatively new branch of medicine called as regenerative medicine. And it is kind of defined as a process of replacing, engineering, or regenerating human or animal cells, tissues or organs to restore or establish function. So stem cells is an integral part of this branch or this field of medicine called as regenerative medicine. Now, before we get into how as psychiatrists we should look at stem cells and their applications uh, let us you know just uh, have a you know very very point wise uh, uh, mention of where all is it being tried and where is, where has it been used and what is happening now there is this uh, i have taken this names or this list of uh, indications from the handbook of stem cell therapy which was published about a year and a half back and this is basically just a part of the index. So there are a lot of things uh, which stem cells, where stem cells have been studied and are probably going to be used therapeutically. Uh, wound healing and scarring. Uh, there, was, there was some uh, uh, role of it in COVID-19 critical care, in inflammatory bowel disease, for liver cell regeneration, for cardiac repair, ocular disease, cartilage repair, Musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal pathology, uh, stem cell probiotic communication. So the, the entire gut brain axis can be kind of addressed using this approach, various kinds of cancers. And of course, what we are going to uh, uh, discuss today are the neuropsychiatric indications where stem cells have been, uh, or this regenerative medicine has is kind of being researched. Now, having said that, what are these stem cells? So uh, it's it's not one kind of a cell. Uh, if you look at this uh, table, uh, there are basically four kinds of stem cells. The mesenchymal stem cells, the neural stem cells, the embryonic stem cells, and induced pluripotent stem cells. And, and each of these are being researched. So uh, stem cell is just not one thing. And it is not like it's 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 one medicine for all. There, there are different kinds of cell, stem cells. Uh, 
depending on their origin, depending on how they differentiate, uh, depending on um, what function they can take on and depending on their side effects, uh, especially how they handle the host immunity. So mesenchymal stem cells, they are probably the most commonly used mesenchymal uh, uh, type of stem cells, which we are concerned with. But let's it's, it's worthwhile noting what are the differences. So mesenchymal stem cells are uh, obtained from adipose tissue, bone marrow, and peripheral blood. So they're very relatively easy to get. And they have the potential to transdifferentiate into neural lineages. Now, again, when we... Uh, we well, just just as a by 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 point, let us uh, uh, be very certain that all psychiatric disorders are disorders of the brain, and when it's a disorder of the brain, how the brain functions depends on how, uh, what is the quality, quantity, connectivity, uh, and functioning of the neurons. So, uh, and, and neurons are not of one type. There are different types of neurons in different parts of the brain. If you look at the cortex, there are the pyramidal neurons. If you look at the cerebellum, there are Purkinje neurons and so many different kinds of neurons. So mesenchymal stem cells, they can differentiate into different kinds of neural cells. What are the advantages is there's so many, uh, you know, uh, regions or areas of the body, uh, parts of the body from where we can get it. And they have got broad immunoregulatory properties. However, the disadvantage is that they are low efficacy and it also depends on donor site morbidity. You know, if I've got a bone marrow issue and if I take uh, cells, mesenchymal stem cells from there, they might not be very healthy and may not uh, serve the purpose for which they are drawn. And there is a chance of tumor formation. When we come to neural stem cells, now this kind of stem cells are strictly neural in origin and they're derived from the fetal brain. Uh, they're self-renewing because they undergo... Uh, multiplication and differentiate into neurons and glial cells, but strictly related to the nervous cells. There is a low risk of tumor formation and it's possible for all neural cell phenotypes, but it's a limited supply and uh, restricted potential to other cells except brain related cells. So for, I mean, if for other branches of re uh, regenerative medicine, apart from uh, neuropsychiatry, uh, they might not be of use. Then we have the embryonic stem cells, which are derived from the blastocyst inner cell mass. So when, uh, when you know the organ systems have not formed and and the fetus, you know we may not call it fetus. It's this this clump of cells, the blastocyst, and if we derive these cells from the inner cell mass, they are the embryonic stem cells. These are truly pluripotent because they have not done anything in life as of now. Henceforth, they are going to. Uh, uh, multiply, 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 and they're going to differentiate, 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 differentiate into all kinds of cells in the body, including the neural stem cells. So they have a high proliferation capacity. So they, they, they have a high potential to multiply. And uh, well, as I mentioned, the potential to induce many specialized cells, not only neurons. But the problem is, since they are not, uh, they are very primitive, they can be rejected by the immune system because they will have a uh, you know a different kind of an antigenic structure on the membrane and within the cell which might not be as simple as or as less problematic as the mesenchymal or the neural stem cells they have got carcinogenic potential because uh, well they they proliferate and uh, their duty is to proliferate their, their their work is to proliferate so it can become carcinogenic and there are ethical conflicts, which uh, we'll probably discuss a bit later on. And then we have the induced pluripotent stem cells or IPSCs as we call it. These are reprogrammed adult somatic tissue. Means what? That from an adult somatic tissue, whatever it is, skin, fibroblasts, uh, we take them, we uh, reprogram them using growth factors and other things. So that from a differentiated cell, they become pluripotent. Means they become stem cells. They can be transplanted and then they will uh, they will grow and take over the function in the area where they are uh, transferred. They, are resist they have a resistance to immune rejection because primarily they have already differentiated, uh, easy to isolate and handle. But there is a limited efficiency of reprogramming. This reprogramming bit is basically how we are going to uh, see to it that whatever is a genetic or an epigenetic defect in the original cell 
is prevented or minimized from causing a problem when they go to their future place of uh, uh, future place in the tissue or a niche as we call it. And they are free from ethical concerns compared to the embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells uh, and uh, neural stem cells which are derived from the embryo or the fetal brain are always going to be subjects of intense debate. Now, when we have this kind of cells, let's talk about something related to us that is psychiatry. Now, when we talk of psychiatric disorders, we, we all of us know that the current diagnosis of psychiatric disorders is symptom based. And what happens is that we only have clusters of symptoms to aid in diagnosis. Diagnosis is not uh, based on any pathology at any level. So to understand disorders better, we need to have various tools. The point is that if we do not understand psychiatric disorders, what are we going to treat? Symptoms, yes. But sooner rather than later, we are going to bang our head against the wall because we are treating only symptoms. We are not really even scratching uh, the little surface below the symptoms. We are not trying to understand what causes this. We are not trying to understand why in a particular individual something like this is caused. How do these disorders move from generation, from one generation to the other? How, uh, when an individual reacts to a certain something happening in the environment, in only a particular individual, some symptoms are caused. So the various ways of, uh, or rather the various modalities of research into psychiatric illnesses have been, till now, one, two, and three. So, First of all, when we look at the genetics of psychiatric disorders, previously there are all these association studies and uh, 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 adoption studies and twin studies and things like that to understand how heritable and in what way heritable are psychiatric disorders. But let's say last 20, 25 years, we have had the genome-wide association studies wherein the entire genome is available to us and we try to understand what are the risk genes that lead to the development of certain traits. Along with the development of this technology, we also have the development of high-powered computers and statistics. So we can put in a lot of data and try and get something meaningful out of that. And the techniques are always, in the last two decades, been on the uh, more development and more efficient side of things. But the thing is that even with so much of technology involved, most of the studies using GWS or genome-wide association studies are underpowered. So there will be 10,000, uh, the, the data of 10,000 patients, for example, but 10,000 compared to the entire population of the earth is, is minuscule. And if it is done only in, let's say, a certain kind of a population, so white population or a Caucasian population, the, the, the findings will not really translate into something meaningful for other races. So these are underpowered. Even if the number of uh, participants in a study are large. And what it has given us till now is small effect variants. Means we understand that there are 200 genes involved in schizophrenia and 500 genes involved in something else. But these genes, each of these genes has a small effect size. So it becomes very difficult for us to understand and you know extrapolate or even think in terms of therapeutics, which is a very long shot, as to what is the effect of each single gene. And which is important of this whole lot. Another way of looking at psychiatric disorders is neuroimaging. So we have had since the uh, development of MRI or availability of MRI, different modalities of structural imaging uh, have are available to us in the sense uh, we have MRI, we have got functional MRI, we have got um, white matter tractography, we have got uh, PET scans which are functional scans. So we get an understanding of what changes can be seen in psychiatric disorders. But all of us know that these findings are not robust findings. These findings are not replicable findings. So again, we draw a blank here when we need to understand what happens here. So am I going to do neuroimaging in all my patients? Maybe not. Am I going to do a PET and a, you know, a structural functional scan together? Maybe not. 
and there is always this issue of spatial and temporal resolution if the mri is good we get a good spatial resolution but uh, if we do a pet we have no idea of what region is where to understand uh, how disorders develop we also looked at animal models so here i have mentioned the rodent model but there are this is a small mammal model we have got a large mammal model like the uh, chimp models or monkey models but what we have tried to you know what we have got out of this studies is the endophenotype so what might be happening because we have got certain models which will mimic certain kinds of psychiatric symptoms and this is in the form of in vivo circuits we can have you know uh, we can remove certain genes and we can have what we call as uh, this gene free mice where they will not express a certain protein and then we can see what happens so when it comes to polygenic variants so again something like psychiatric disorders where there are too many things involved these models may not hold up and how much we can translate from animal studies into human studies is always a problem and that's why we come to this stem cell model where we can do a lot of things uh like you know understanding neural subtypes with intact genetics we can have disease relevant assays because we are taking the sample stem cells from the diseased individual but the issues are immaturity loss of epigenetics batch variations or heterogeneity which some of which will be which we will see later so what is done so let's say we have a, a skin biopsy and from there we reprogram the cells this is this is the technology this is the this is where the lab comes in and a lot of uh, uh, processes happen which is not our concern at the moment so we develop human ipscs this differentiate into neurons and this can be trans uh, you know transferred into a host so what do we study we can study progenitor cell for proliferation how cells divide migration neuronal morphology connectivity synaptic maturation and neuronal activity overall this is grossly the neurons and the cells of the cns but we can also understand how neuronal and glial subtypes function neurons and glia now especially the glia are important for managing the inflammatory status in the nervous system not only they are supporting cells that they help in myelination and production of certain uh, neurotransmitters but they also help in maintaining the inflammatory status we can also understand at a final level how these specific neurotransmitter systems work because we have a cell or we have cells where we have kind of understood their function their genetics you know at a very basic level because we have processed them and now we are introducing them into a diseased individual to see what is happening they also they are also important from the point of view of assays for diagnostic and drug testing uh, to study highly penetrant mutations so what exactly happens with this 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 kind of a procedure or stem cells can help us to you know uh, develop biomarkers and now we have got something called as three dimensional ipsc derived organoids this is a group of cells stem cells which have been programmed to kind of take over the function of a certain part of the brain a small part of the brain and it can be studied in the lab so this organoid let's say which will resemble a portion of the prefrontal cortex for example can be studied in the lab right from the point of how it develops how the neurons mature how they connect with each other what is the influence of genetics as well as epigenetics and external environment and finally how it functions so this is what is called as three dimensional organoids now over time so since night from 1998 till now we have got certain kind of stages or important things in the development of stem cell research when it comes to psychiatric disorders it started with uh, the first uh, embryonic stem cell harvested from the blastocyst that was in 98 and after that first human ipsc is generated from skin fibroblasts in 2011 functional midbrain dopaminergic neurons were generated also from disc1 patients disc1 is the gene which is uh, 
understood to be malfunctioning in schizophrenia patients. So we have IPSs which will focus on this gene. Uh, development of IPSs from schizophrenia patients displaying decreased connectivity. And we also had in 13, 2013 development of functional GABAergic interneurons. So grossly, you know, from neuronal, from neurons, we have gone to specific neurons, from specific neurons to more specific, specifically functioning neurons, like dopaminergic neurons, like GABAergic interneurons. In 2014, generation of neurons from bipolar disorder patients, and again, serotonergic neurons from fibroblast, uh, serotonergic neurons from uh, embryonic stem cells and pluripotent stem cells. So this is kind of work in progress where we are you know, understanding not only the gross uh, neuronal uh, attributes, but how they function uh, and in a particular disorder. Now, when it comes to depression, so, uh, you know, what are certain studies? Now, let me make one thing very clear is we are still in very basic neuroscience studies. So these are animal models that we are talking of. I mean, after reading this, if somebody is going to do some kind of a treatment for a psychiatric disorder using this is highly not done. It is going to be problematic because we are still in the process of understanding one, the pathogenesis of a disorder and two, what stem cells do. Our knowledge of stem cells is not complete. I mean, not so is our knowledge of understanding psychiatric disorders. So the current research for depression focuses on mesenchymal stem cells and neural stem cells. And the idea is to study BDNF, that is brain-derived neurotropic signaling upregulation, which stimulates neurogenesis and reduces depressive symptoms in mouse models. Why is this specific? Because in depression, what is understood is that there is a loss of neurons in the hippocampus. And uh, this is the basis of all the depressive symptoms that happen. And this reduction in the number of neurons has many factors. The idea is to build up the healthy action, healthy activity and number of neurons for which we require growth factors or neurotropic factors. Brain-derived neurotropic factor is one important growth factor for neurons. So if BDNF signaling can be increased, we can produce more neurons in a patient and improve the depression or improve the depression along with the treatment that we give as usual. Another way, uh, another uh, you know, area of research with IPSCs is in PTSD. So basically, hyperactive amygdala, uh, as a result of previous catastrophic stress or trauma, but basically catastrophic stress or trauma acting on uh, the genetics to make the amygdala more vulnerable when it develops. Uh, what happens is that with stem cells, uh, we can transfer this stem cells, IPSCs, into neural uh, proliferative, uh, neuroproliferative cells and glial cells and whatever is damaged in hippocampus. So PTSD also forms a, uh, also has a similar pathophysiology. Reduction in hippocampal neurons, loss of dendrites, loss of connectivity. So when we introduce these cells, we can kind of repair the hippocampal damaged neurons resulting in increased expression of BDNF, glial derived factor and growth factor associated proteins. So idea is that when hippocampus is active, it can kind of balance the hyperactive amygdala activity. So the memory coding is improved. When memory coding is improved, all those flashbacks, all those all that avoidance behaviors, all those intrusive thoughts, intrusive dreams, nightmares, this reduces. And there is a restructuring of memory. So depression we talked about, PTSD we talked about. Now, when it comes to two major psychiatric uh, disorders, that is schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorder, there has been relatively more amount of uh, data that is available to us. So for schizophrenia, now this first two slides are on the use of stem cells for studying or researching into the etiology of this disorder. So a number of studies in schizophrenia using the uh, induced uh, stem cell type. So uh, these stem cells, whether in control, I mean, these are all schizophrenia patients as uh, control studies. 
very small number of studies. These are all phase one studies, you know, kind of proof of concept studies. So if something comes up, then more studies can be done to, you know, kind of uh, have a more robust findings. So when it comes to schizophrenia, uh, people have studied neuronal neural progenitor cells, the type of neurons, cortical interneurons and cortical organoids. But what are the primary results? So people have understood that there is reduced synaptic connectivity, dendritic arborization, decreased neurites, uh, decreased migration and outgrowth, reduced synaptic vesicles, uh, re uh, problems with WNT signaling. You know, so, so, so this is what people have understood happens in the brain of a schizophrenia patient compared to controls. So you, this is again, as I said, in a very, very uh, initial research stage. So when it comes to autism, again, what people have done, again, they have used similar kinds of cells, progenitor cells, neurons, telencaphenic cerebral and subcortical organoids, and found out that there is a reduction in excitatory synapses, reduced GABA, reduced GABA, you can so many findings. So again, this is just a snapshot. This, are, this is, you know, kind of, uh, just a few studies which are working to understand the pathophysiology of schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorder. When it comes to drug discovery, what have people tried to understand? Like, what are the specific drug altered expression, uh, expression of schizophrenia related genes? Means, with this neural progenitor cells, we can understand that this schizophrenia related genes in from a patient will uh, get altered compared to normal or control patient genes when but when certain drugs are you know administered so when we give them valproate okay whatever genes expression is there schizophrenia related genes that gets altered to an extent so we know that how valproate works for us valproate you know kind of just reduces cortical activity or excitation reduces aggression but at a very basic level, at a genetic level, what it does. So those individuals who have got schizophrenia related genes can have a better outcome because certain things, increased concentrations of potassium and zinc, especially in clo close up in resistant schizophrenia patients can be reversed to an extent by valproate. So one of the strategies, clinical strategies of resistance, when even close up in is not working, is to add something like this. When it comes to autism, neurons derived from autism induced pluripotent stem cells treated with in growth factor 1 have an increased GABAergic interneuron. So, uh, what people have done is understand the excitatory inhibitory balance. Increase in shank 3 messenger RNA expression has been studied. And when we have this, what is the effect of lithium valproate and fluoxetine vis-a-vis this shank 3 uh, abnormal uh, neurons. So whenever we have got neurons, which have got a shank 3 protein, uh, uh, how do these drugs, the drugs that we already have, lithium valproatine, fluoxetine, what do they do? That in this shank 3 containing synapses, they improve spontaneous calcium oscillation. So the synapse becomes better, stronger. In therapy, uh, this medial uh, median ganglionic eminence transplant into the ventral hippocampus. Uh, MGE is seen in embryos or rather developing fetus. And this is the area which develops into this basal ganglia and uh, midbrain structures, limbic structures. So MGE transplant into the ventral hippocampus. So very specific things. It normalizes firing of dopamine cells in the downstream ventral tegmental area. So this kind of a thing this kind of a thing can help us to understand and probably use this treatment modality for positive symptoms. Now, interneurons are of various types. It's not just one kind of GABAergic interneuron, but uh, interneurons are three or four types depending on what protein they express. So this is parvalbumin. So uh, when this PV or SST positive interneurons were transplanted into the ventral hippocampus, they reduce the firing rate and increase the uh, potentials, uh, IPSC amplitudes in ventral, hippocamp uh, ventral hippocampal pyramidal cells. 
this reduces the hyperactivity in the dopamine system and attenuated dopamine related cognitive deficit so this strategy in fact if we look at the persisting cognitive deficits in schizophrenia uh, one of the thing that has uh, that is seen in research time and again is this parvalbumin containing interneurons there is a deficit of these neurons by which uh, as a result of which the 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 excitatory inhibitory imbalance that is the imbalance between gaba and glutamate is is kind of toppling towards cognitive impairment so it doesn't function well so this kind of sets it straight uh when it comes to autism again we have parvalbumin positive interneurons transplanted into the medial prefrontal cortex in this study model of autism uh mesenchymal stem cells intracerebrovascular injection reduced stereotype patterns beha of behavior improved cognitive flexibility vocalization social behaviors and in a follow up study the effects lasted for at least 6 months after testing mesenchymal stem cells injected into the third ventricle again reduced symptoms and also reduced anxiety like behaviors iv and intrathecal injections one infusion per week of for four weeks of human cord blood mononuclear cells and umbilical cord derived mesenchymal stem cells produce overall improvement intrathecal autologous bone marrow mononuclear cells also now these are the these are what various uh, researchers have tried to study now as i said this is all study this is all research so uh, what are the caveats then what do we need to keep in mind one uh, we saw that mesenchymal stem cells are extremely heterogeneous population of cells with no specific cell markers so the problem is when they go to where they are supposed to go okay uh, whether they are doing their activity specifically there is no way to know it is also impossible impossible to ensure that the cells will reach the target site so when we give intrathecal or we give uh bone marrow or we give i mean we cannot give it you know in the third ventricle uh we are not sure whether they will even reach the site forget whether they are doing the specific activity little is known about the behavior of the cells in vivo see when it's in a when it's in a petri dish it's fine we have like all kinds of control and observation but whether uh there are any immunological properties of the cells over a period of time we do not know these cells are thought to have their beneficial effect to their ability to suppress immune signaling promote neurogenesis and everything that we talked about but these are postulated mechanisms this is what we understand from theory but are they the only mechanisms are they the complete mechanisms we still do not know and so apart from this small case series or small studies we we need to have highly standardized and efficient protocols for growing stem cells marking them how they are going to go to a specific area and what they are going to do unless and until we are sure this is going to be still research thank you so much and uh, we'll um, i'll stop my sharing and i'll invite uh, dr sydney to make his comments thank you dr sydney am i visible yes you are visible or not visible yeah so thanks dr male uh, it was a very clear and concise presentation so like what we had initially discussed was i mean we'll just run a little bit of introduction which dr male has done about what stem cells are what is the status try to explain where it is then when we have a basic understanding then we will come to the topic about why we are discussing what we are discussing today is there use of stem cell in psychiatry what are the potential misuse that can happen or is happening and how do we address it uh the dr male has quoted a lot of studies and i would like a little bit of more clarifier they are all animal models and when we talk about autism and the induced stem cells they are done on laboratory mice or on any other animal where the genes are knocked out and you introduce an induced stem cell or try to introduce certain molecules which will play behavior which is akin to The, the human form of autism and said that there is an improvement in the repetitive behavior or some of the female rats or female mouse becomes a little bit more mother like so it's the way forward but we are still a long way away from where we are uh, whether it is autism schizophrenia or bipolar our understanding like dr haveer said that 
is very, very limited. We are all going by a symptom-based classification rather than an etiology-based classification. And when we have not really understood what we are looking at, definitely, yes, there are some clues and hints either from epigenetics, genetics, imaging, metabolomics, saying that stem cell is the only thing which is going to help. Uh, I, it is going to be a little bit of an erroneous conclusion. We need more work. So I think we can start a discussion. Okay, so um, uh, do we have any chat questions? Okay, so uh, well, somebody has asked a question. This is Dr. Ankur Singhal. Uh, as I understand, it is very basic research and almost no clinical use for many years. But how long do you think? Any estimate? Oh, okay, so I mean, if we look at the the work done in other areas of medicine, uh, the FDA or the US has given uh, what do you call an accelerated approval for stem cell research only in three areas. That is uh, spinal disorder, uh, some ischemic injury, and definitely neurodegenerative disorders are not being suggested that we should do at this point of time. I mean, that is where the clarity should be there at where, what are we looking at and what should we be looking at? But having said that, the lot, the organoids or the brain model, basically organoids are your induced stem cell induced stem cells you grow them and you also try to see the migration pattern i mean it looks very simple but some work are ongoing to say that yes at, at least in the animal model the the implant the the homing and at least the differentiation is happening if we go by a straight periodic timeline of how many years it's very difficult to say because technology is improving probably maybe in a decade or so we can have some significant meaningful reproducible i mean work not just doing an open level study and claim that we have done something without any comparison so that is the best answer uh, melissa what's your opinion yeah that's true i mean uh, we we are uh, our disorders are uh, uh, you know multi uh, are polygenic even if you look at genetics apart yes. from the genetics we also have uh, so many epigenetic, epigenetic uh, uh, changes that have happened and that have you know, kind of been transmitted over generations uh, we know some of them we do not know many of them uh, and also we do not know what is the importance of a particular epigenetic uh, marker or a pointer in a particular disorder or something like that uh, and, and of course, there's a lot of overlap. So until and unless uh, we are very clear about what causes a disorder now compared to, let's say, a neurological disorder or a cardiac disorder or so many other disorders where even if the etiology is not very clear, I mean, if there's no one etiology, there are a few etiologies, but which are well understood. And there is a chance that something like this will be, will work better in that. So unless and until we know about uh, the etiology per se, that is difficult. Second thing is uh, the process itself. I mean, it, it is about 20 years or so, 20, 25 years since we have kind of uh, understood what are stem cells and you know how they, what are the different types and what how they can be uh, uh, you know uh, transferred into a host. But uh, these are these are cells and uh, like any cell, they are going to divide. And, and there are so many properties of a cell, again, that we do not, even at a basic science level. Here we are talking of uh, immunological. So, so basically when we transfer something, there is going to be a host uh, recipient uh, interaction and, and it, it can be problematic by itself. I mean, whatever we are trying to gain, it might just get wiped off just because of this and uh, it will only mean that you know there is uh, we cannot do the procedure again. So, uh, so the nature of our illnesses, the the biology and the uh, of the cells, uh, it becomes very difficult. Uh, I mean, it's going to take a long time so to understand these things better. So yeah, we do not have uh, we have certain 
vistas that we can look at but this is just that we we cannot really translate that into uh, treatments like those few fda uh, i think uh, we have something for uh, uh, disorders like uh, uh, cardiac disease limb ischemic disease spinal cord injury just a few but 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 yeah, these are very very true. very specific yeah. kind of things so uh, unlikely i mean we need to we need to understand and uh, know a lot more so one if thing to... uh, yeah yes please yeah no please go on, please go on no no i'll i'll get that question later no 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 please yeah yeah see what i uh, also i mean i i try to give a very simplified picture of uh, uh, what stem cells are and all that and i have understood this but uh, you know uh, now how, how and the, in, in the caveat also i mentioned that the first thing is okay i know we have got certain cells and these are going to work and we introduce them by whatever way how do we you know how do we is there any way or are people looking at do the cells reach where they are supposed to reach because then then only something will happen i mean they cannot be moving around in the blood stream or somewhere and then you know if they are just doing it they might be just killed off and done nothing goes to the 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 site where they are supposed to go and act. So how are people kind of handling this thing or looking at it? So just adding to what Dr. Malay has already said, uh, during my experience in demands in India, I'm just sharing and uh, something which we, I mean, I was not involved. I have to be very clear here. A little bit of a work, but this was done, a dedicated work by one of my colleagues. Maybe we should invite him the next one if we have the next one. Uh, there was the first was to use induced stem cell to make a differentiate into a neuronal cell. That was taking almost more than three years because every time it induces by the fourth or the fifth cycle, it dies. I mean, making the cell live was a challenge. It is overcome. Now we, they have reached a stage where you have organoids or cerebroids. Particularly, this was done in the context of bipolar patient in India, in Nimas. The migration pattern is very, very haphazard. If you introduce lithium at a very, very molecular level, it tries to normalize this. It is just to show that, yes, we have understand bipolar probably much better than what it was at this level. And that's the second stage. The differentiation is yet to happen. When I say differentiation, means differentiating into more mature cell, it is yet to happen, but they are multiplying. It is still way, way, we are far away from using it as a medium or probably puncturing the brain or the nose and say, that, okay, let's try to inject it in the frontal cortex and see what, whether it works. Not going to happen. Probably this is going to be a wrong technique. This is also the stage where most of the people who are really working in our diseases, whether it is schizophrenia, bipolar, autism for that matter, are at this stage. We are mostly at the stage of the organoids when we look at the model. And this is one of the models. I mean, we are not, when we are looking at the organoids or the cerebroids as we understand, we are not completely taking into consideration what are the epigenetic changes happening around when we are manipulating it. Uh, we cannot be playing gods at this stage. It, we are just simple people trying to understand a simple cell which may not be differentiated into a pyramidal cell. It can just wind up as a glia or as a supporting cell which has got really no function other than support. And yeah, I mean, we are one step forward, one or a couple of steps forward in the past 20, 25 years, but that is how science is. We are dealing with the most complex organ of the body. And as much as we thought or we understand, we know our illnesses, we are all symptom or syndrome-based diagnosis that we are really dealing at. So the classification itself has a limitation. So, I mean, it's somewhere we are trying to reach from various angles and make a meaningful conclusion. Yes, the medicines are working. We are just trying to understand. If you remember, Dr. Kamale, I mean, during our training, early 2000 or even before that, we 
what was stored is just lithium works in bipolar mechanism X and we don't know. I mean, mm. it is unknown. Mm. Or ECT, we don't know. Now we know how lithium works. We are beginning to understand that it helps in the cellular migration of every neurons. So this is one mechanism which is better understood. So, I mean, we are evolving. It is the way forward, but not there yet. Okay, some questions have come. Um, um, huh. uh, okay, there is a center working on autism, uh, on stem cell treatment for autism. Your opinion on that? We we don't op give an opinion on that. The there is a statement from Indian Psychiatric Society that this is not to be done. It is not a therapy which is of any benefit. So we do not do it. And we advise our patients, parents, that this is not an individual opinion. This has been studied well. This has been uh, also a consensus that this is something that need, this is not going to work. And at this stage, we do not know much about it. So just avoid it. Bhaskar, you want to say anything? Use your hand. Huh? Yeah, you're on screen now. Yes. Neurogen, I'm directly telling the name of the center. Neurogen is exploiting poor patients. And they are an organization that has been banned in Sri Lanka. It is an organization that has been banned in a lot of countries all over the world. There are multiple legal cases hanging on this institution. But this institution goes on in India because India, as we all know, is a corrupt country. And anything happens in India. But otherwise, no stem cell guideline all over the world support use of stem cell therapy in autism, support use of stem cell therapy in any neurodegenerative disorder, and definitely do not support use of stem cell in a schizophrenia patient of 10 or 15 years. These are the patients that have been given stem cell in that institution. So avoid, if possible, for this institution. This is a very bad institution. No, this or any other institution that offers uh, stem cell for autism is just, I mean, yes. not to be done. Yes. Forget yeah, this or anything. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Because pe people will come up with yeah. some kind of quick fixes. They and are all, just but, manipulating. Yeah, whatever it is. So, uh, no, it is not yeah. useful for autism. It is not useful. A, B, C, D, anything. Okay, so. If uh, we have yes. to. Yes, 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 yes. Indeed. If we have to be super neutral towards any institute which is trying something their hands on on stem cells, okay, for a few seconds, let me give them the credit that, okay, they are going some step forward. Not wrong, right? Not wrong, but it is very dense. So let's just discuss about what, have we understood autism good enough, right? We, and we know that there are some genetic errors in autism. Some can be in, inherited. Some can be de novo, some can be intrauterine. Yeah, I mean, all kind of genetic error, right? Mm -hmm. And there are candidate genes. It is not a simple Mendelian inheritance that there is a gene, there is a disease you inherit because your parents has it and you may or may not have the disease. Psychiatry does not work like that. We have candidate genes, not one, not two, but hundreds and more. There is difference of expression, there is difference of penetration across generations. All right. Hmm. So the stem cell which is being used from the individual to be given back to the individual, the source in India probably is a cord blood or at least a peripheral blood from which it is harvested without any gene editing tool. And please understand the gene editing tool that we have as of today, they are all research tool, not validated enough to have a clinical application as of today. So if they don't do a, a gene editing, and when we say gene editing, how what are the genes that you are looking at and how many genes are you editing and to what level, right? So these are complex questions and answers which I'm not sure how much they will be able to give. But if there is no gene editing, you are using the same genome which was defective to start with to repair a genetic error using the same gene. This is wrong. So this is complete anti science.
So this is, I mean, we should be very clear. It is just basic common sense. The genes were something missing, not functioning to start with. You are using the same thing. I mean, it's just like when you are trying to change the engine oil of your car, you are using the 10,000 kilometer oil engine to do the same thing again with ions and things. And it's going to damage further. If not, I mean, anything. Okay. So it's an oversimplification. Okay. So on that, there is another thing that, uh, another kind of trend that uh, uh, I, I think is on similar lines is this uh, collection of cord blood at birth and, you know, preserving it for eternity. Uh, and then, you know, with the idea that if something happens to me uh, at 70 years of age, if I get dementia, I, you know, put the cells back in my system and it will take care of that. So how good is that logic? Because umbilical cord will have mesenchymal stem cells. Yes, fine. But anything beyond that? Uh, okay. I mean, if, if we just remember our basic embryology from anatomy, just start with the germ layer, the three layer, how it forms into gastrulation, the layer separate, then what is left is the, the umbilicus or the core, which has only a one, certain few subsets. Yes, I mean, if you have to say there is no other source to harvest because the technology when cord blood storing started was stem cell was very, very primitive. Okay, you got one source, fine. But uh, now on the, the business or the industry part of it, is it is it a free service given for public utility? No, you are paying for it. Uh, yes, it might be strove properly, but again, there is a difference of viability. And if you are going to the I am born today, 2024, my parents have stored my cold blood, and 2000, 2000 maybe 2020, 2001 uh, when I am 50 years. By the time the technology might have changed so much that you no longer require the cord blood which you are still going to store for 50 years to be used on you when there could be more safer, more easier alternatives. So from a business standpoint, as an end user, I don't think there is any economic sense, there is any scientific sense of it. Because when we are inducing other cells to become a stem cell, and the process is evolving 50 more years when I as a child want today becomes 50, 50 years later, the technology would have evolved. Okay. Uh, uh, an interesting uh, question by Dr. Pfizer. So his question is, where is it gone? Yeah. Uh, is it possible to rebuild stem cells naturally by way of intermittent fasting or fasting of any kind? Pascal, do you like to answer that? Yes. First, we have to understand that intermittent fasting is not going to do anything specific to anywhere. It is a way of starving body and that would sustain some cell preservation procedure that would not directly stimulate any stem cell, number one. Number two, stem cells of body, they reside in their organ specific niche area. In brain that is hippocampus and periventricular area. In other organ it is some other area. So by intermittent fasting if you are going to nudge the stem cell renewal process we have to do direct manipulation of jagged notch pathway direct manipulation of various few other kinds of pathway, it is not possible by a, such a general intermittent fasting. So forget it. It is another hype, nothing more than that. Uh, Dr. Ritwik Chatterjee has asked a question. Uh, negative consequences of stem cell therapy, we are imagining that the stem cells differentiate into neurons in the brain, but can it differentiate into anything else tumors possible? My answer is it is possible. Uh, Sydney? Yes, definitely. I mean, we are dealing with stems, I mean, stem cells manipulated apparently and they have enormous potential. Yes, I mean, theoretically, we say what was supposed to be a neuron can become a bone cell. And even for the so-called neuronal cell in animal model, 
when it comes to migration, it doesn't reach the site where it is supposed to have reached. And if it is trapped in the in the white matter when it is supposed to reach the cortex and discharging and communicating electrical impulses, you are going to have a seizure which is going to be impossible to treat. So it is not just a malignancy. I mean, when we inject stem cells or when we talk about stem cells, there are a lot of it. Yes, theoretically, you said that there are homing signals. They will go given by the growth factor, by this, blah, 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 blah. But there, there are a lot in between. When you inject a stem cell, you're also going to press the blood brain barrier. Yes, theoretically, it should repair. But does the repair happen all the time? No, it doesn't. So uh, with evol evolution of the technology, this some of this would be overcome. But we are discussing about where do we stand today? We are not there yet. Dr. Divay Mangala asks a question. Suppose siblings of uh, an autism ASD individual, siblings or schizophrenia patient are normal. Can their stem cell be of help in future? So sibling of uh, an affected individual. All right. So here is, I mean, it is opening another pathway for discussion, which is a good one. But so let's discuss about Simple transplantation. Are you going to take organ from a twin, which is a monozygotic twin or dizygotic twin? What is the probability of having a rejection if you are either one of them and which one is safer? So from a theoretical perspective about if we consider the cell as an organ or at least a collection of cell will be an organ by, by that definition. Yes, uh, you may or may not have an immune reaction. Okay, If it is auto if it is twins, as in the real twins, then yes, the, your, your immunological reaction, theoretically speaking, should be less. But here the question is not about immunological re rejection or acceptance or that pathway. It is about, have we understood this neurodegenerative disease or neurodevelopmental disorder good enough to say that stem cells are the way forward? This is a difficult question to answer. And if we have to be clear on the basis of medical research and ethics of doing no harm rather than a probable harm, then my answer would be a very, very strong no. When, because when we say the unaffected sibling, psychiatric genetics is not Mendelian. It has variable penetration and expressivity. The, the definition of unaffected is we don't know how are we defining unaffected because unless you do a whole exome sequencing or genome sequencing, then it's you can't say this person may or may not have the illness at the current moment. So it is a lot of questions that left to be answered when at this point of time. Yeah, even even normal, so called normal, uh, first degree relatives, immediate family members, siblings of affected individuals are known to have certain traits. Uh, which are kind of uh, uh, milder versions of the symptoms that a patient has. This is known, and in fact, this the 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 distribution of uh, you know phenomenology is is also on a kind of a Gaussian curve, from absolute zero to full blown disorder. And there are a lot of things in between, and most relatives are on that curve. They are not on zero. Uh, they may not be on hundred, but they are definitely not on zero. So it is very very unlikely that. Uh, uh, even if we use the stem cells, it's going to be a completely normal genome. Because when we have so many hundreds of genes participating in the production of a disease, uh, it is always going to be, as you said, variable. You might, you know, in fact, it might happen that a particular active and, you know, kind of driving, so to say, a variant goes into maybe there, but it is not getting manifested because others are, are you know, kind of not allowing it. Okay. Um, Dr. Alim Siddiqui asks, in what medical conditions stem cell therapy is currently useful? I think we mentioned that, but uh, if you would tell us again. Allogenic bone marrow transfusion. Only one thing. Allogenic stem cell treatment for bone marrow transplantation. Only treatment that can be done with stem cell at this stage. There is Second for 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 which which condition this. for which condition for acute leukemias it is possible 
but for multiple myeloma it is not possible it is not going to be curative it would just prolong life in other condition it is of doubtful efficacy specifically myeloid dysplastic syndrome and other thing it is of doubtful ability so only acute leukemias where we have been able to successfully irradiate the whole body and bone marrow and we have harvested the bone marrow stem cell from the patient before and have genetically manipulated them and then again transfused back to the bone marrow there it is a curative procedure only curative procedure for acute leukemias but that is where the usefulness end for plasma cell neoplasm even if we de do all these thing there is no guarantee of cure for other hematological near malignancies or pre malignancy condition so far no use then the second use that is coming up is kind of using nanotechnology and stem cell together for burn nanotechnological mesh stem uh, and stem cell grafted on that are going to be used not used yet any there is no other medical condition who can we have been able to successfully use beta black beta which can, which which is the uh, condition you mentioned the nanotechnology with stem cells probable use probable use means the initial preclinical trials and early clinical trials have been cleared for for which indication for extensive burn wound okay burn okay burn. only okay. thing only thing uh, that is Gachi. so far clearing Gachi. Gachi. otherwise no baskar and if i have to just supplement what dr baskar has said uh mm -hmm. when we talk about stem cell or stem cell derived therapies we are just not talking about the cells we are also talking about the vesicles we are also talking about the delivery models mm -hmm. so as an as an experimental tool exosomes has are been tried to deliver chemotherapeutic agents to the tumor so that at least that also needs a transporter like a, a bacteriophage or a viral transporter or at least a, a guide rna i mean there will be a discussion for another day where yeah. it is believed it will reach the tumor site and probably kill the tumor cell so i mean those are some of the things where it is being looked at on a purely clinical trial not even a okay. trial at a laboratory basis mm -hmm. and even in when we say bone marrow trans transplant mm -hmm. are is it really a transplant mm -hmm. that is a difficult question because the the cells which are unless manipulated like oh. dr vaskar has said the probability of getting the tumor back is also there this is that you are said you are using a fresh set of stem cells which is likely to regenerate a completely damaged bone marrow so that's like uh, that's an open yeah oh, okay um dr nachiketa desai asks uh, desperate parents want to try almost everything that gives them hope to cure the autism and disorders like that but stem cell research is not ready for clinical use so what would be the better use of parents resources okay so do people want the, the clinical answer or do people want the 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 the, the hard truth okay the Both. clinical answer would be you can have the menu no problem i mean the the, the clinical answer is we need to educate people that stem cell has got an enormous potential to be used for a lot of disorder and but we need to be patient at this point of time i have asked all my colleagues in australia in new zealand read up the fda guidelines uk nowhere nowhere it is recommended they are not going to do that i mean they think it's not about bragging but the research potential the, the amount of research that is being done in this country is much ahead of what is happening in india even at this stage it, it's not being recommended it's not that it is not done by some centers or quote unquote business interest it, it does but it is very very tightly regulated and they don't last long so awareness 
from our side is the key, the Indian Psychiatric Society, that is the request to my friends, if they're still around it, we need to be very, very proactive in advocating what we stood today, because if it has been used in conditions where, or rather being misused or misinformed, if the, the public should not hedge themselves at the time when it is actually worked. I agree with Vaska that the rules are very, very loose or people define left, right in our country, but it doesn't stop us from informing the people, even if it means trying to be a little firm and assertive, whatever it means. Right. So we have to be very clear. But if we try to take, okay, we this person seems to offer some hope to desperate parents we are actually validating a crime. Let's be very clear on this part. Let's be very, very clear. Not doing is validating. Not doing is endorsing. So we cannot, as a, as a group of psychiatrists, researchers, teachers, physicians, we cannot, cannot endorse this. I mean, we should not be a party to a crime. Let's be very clear. No, no nothing to be a same or a bear at this point of time. Non-clinical or what you call a, a life tip. Yes, people are, the parents are worried about their children. Probably they should get a good systemic investment plan, which they start now and probably by 25 years, the, the child will be a millionaire. And which by the from the interest that is being generated by the park fund, probably it will be sufficient to give a lot of medical support later on in life. I would consider it as a good investment rather than throwing away hard-earned money to a, to a group which is basically no better than a con job. I, I know it sounds very harsh, but I think we, some of us need to speak it today. Yes. Right. Um, okay. Uh, we do not have any further questions. So... Um, any comments, Baska? Before uh, I mean, we can wait for a few minutes. So, do you want to tell us something more? Uh, the same request also goes for Doctor Sydney. We might have mm. not uh, touched upon something, or uh, you know, something that I might have missed. So, uh, I would say that only one thing I can add to this comprehensive talk already. That is, we psychiatrists have to form a strong advocacy group in collaboration with pediatrician and developmental pediatrician as well as other groups of people who are working in the field of child psychiatry so that we can really pressurize the policymaker. Otherwise, this type of talk that we are going to arrange would help, but that just would help the parents to understand things more. They won't stop the exploitation. Only way exploitation can be stopped is if we form a strong lobby, if we pressurize the policymaker, and ultimately we are able to ban these institutions. Uh, yes, I mean, since we are discussing it so frankly so let me put one one thing which is in my mind very very which was nagging me for quite some time none of us are expert in stem cells we are just trying to share information whatever we can with little that we have in the best possible way right but it does not prevent us from stopping to learn further and to share the information with our colleagues so this is one thing mm. we as a psychiatrist needs to do it very, very honestly. We also doesn't need to feel inferior or less knowledgeable because somebody speaks some jargon which sounds like science, but is basically misinformation. People saying that, okay, I have done an implant for this patient using cord blood. You have done, uh, we have done a PET MRI or this thing. We have to ask them, please show us evidence because science is science only when the same work can be reproduced by another group in a similar circumstances yielding the same exact result. 
other than other than that, it will be there is no difference between religious claim and quackery or fakery in this matter, right? Just because we feel we don't know, and somebody seems to be talking some terms in stem cells and basics and genetics, doesn't mean that we have to unknowingly endorse or believe that okay, this person is doing a great thing. It is also being done by some other centers, so maybe we can endorse the same to some of our patients unknowingly. So this is a mistake which we need to realize within ourselves. By our own misinformation or the leg information, have we accidentally unknowingly endorsed some of them? So some of the some of the internal audits should also start with us. Because if some of us continue to do it for whatever reason, then it defeats the purpose of why we are doing what we are doing today. So some of the in-house cleaning also needs to be done. I know some, some of my colleagues might get offended, but we have to be very honest. It is our subject. Yeah. It is our illness. Everybody else is doing everything which is medically related, technology related, and we are made to listen and think that we don't know anything. But when we are much more capable than what we are. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sydney, and thanks, Baskar. Uh, I think we had a good discussion, a very novel topic, a uh, topic yes. uh, which we actually should be, uh, you know, something like uh, we should be learning about all these things in the first few months of taking up psychiatry, not uh, like me, you know, 25, 26 years of practice. And then, you know, I'm kind of reading and trying to understand what makes sense and what is useless. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, all the in audience for your questions. I'm sure you will have more and please feel free. Uh, with that, I hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Rajkumar sir. Thank you, Drs. Malay, Sydney and Bhaskar steering us through this turmoil that's going on to subscribe to it or to deny it. Giving us that clarity definitely helps us to stand our ground now and say a firm no when it is no. Thank you, audience, for being patiently listening to it. Good night to all of you. If you have yeah, any I queries, just interrupt, sir. if I you just have interrupt. any queries, please uh, put sir, it on. Sir, Sydney wants to say something. Yes, yeah, Sydney. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there is something which I was uh, had in my mind since it is an academic forum and probably there are some PG students here. There are three things I would like to share. There are more than 6,000 stem cell research registered, 6,000, it's a big number, but less than 50 are actually satisfying the criteria for what is a real research or an RCT or a double binding. Fine. The last two years, there has been some meta-analysis in stem cell and autism, which are done by people who have done some similar work before, and it seems to be suggesting that it works. That is where we need to be very careful at what we are reading at. And meta analysis and a systemic analysis or a systemic review is good as only when the data it is being supplied is good. I have read every one of them, including the references which they have quoted. None of them, I'm saying none of them are for efficacy trial. They are only to establish safety. It is cold blood, so not much of a reaction. None of them improve the parameters that we use in autism, whether it is social disconnect or emotional reactivity or those things. It, it doesn't. But they have very slightly said that it might. So please be very mindful about people quoting that or oh, this meta-analysis in 2022 or 21 has shown some benefit. It doesn't. You need to read through every one of them. There is no talk about whether medication was used. There is no talk about behavior therapy being used. There is no talk about the severity of the illness of the children when they were being given this one. So it's opaque. It is hazy. It is wasted. So science can sometimes lie if the data are not correct. So with this, I would say that's it. Thank you. Good night to all and uh, good morning to you, Sydney. You must be perhaps now in the early mornings of your day. Anyway, it's catch up with sleep, now. whatever is remaining. Yeah. Bye then for now. Thank you so much. Thanks Bye. to Alchem for the logical help over here.
Bye, Sam. Good night. Good night, Mr. Kudal. Bye.